from the Gospel of John, from the third chapter, we'll be reading verses 1 through 17. So hear this word. <coughs> now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of God for all of us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Every Christian at some point, every Christian at some point in their journey, or reach a point where they say, God, can you give me a sign. Can you show me something? Uh, should I take this job? Should I make this move? Should I retire? Uh, should I get married? Should I have children? What should I do in this situation? I don't know. Well, show me your will. Give me a sign. Speak to me. Let me see your face. Give me something. Like, just show me what you want. Every Christian has said this at one point in their walk. Nicodemus, this is kind of where he is. Nicodemus He's part of this Pharisee set, and it's, it's a very kind of rigid, sort of legalistic group of, of Jews, and, and not all Jews are like this, and not all Pharisees are like this, but, but this particular group was. It, it was so much so that their faith was really dry. There was no juice in it. Uh, the people who were poor, they would sort of kind of take advantage of them, put a heavy yoke on them. The Pharisees themselves would continue to get richer. And so Nicodemus saw all this, and there was no passion, no zeal for God. And then Jesus said, and Jesus is giving sign after sign. Sign, sign, everywhere is sign. I'm not going to sing the song. Anymore. But the point is that he comes and he, Christ is a marvel. He's doing these miracles. He's changing water into wine. Uh, I mean, his teachings are radical. I mean, everywhere he goes, he's a show. And so he, he you know, sort of finds him one night and he begins talking to him. And I want to focus on those, not on John 3, 16 today, but on those first two verses. He says that Jesus... I know that you are of God because nobody can do those signs. To which Christ says, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. It was almost like Christ was saying, look, I'm glad that you like my signs. <laughs> I'm glad that you appreciate my miracles. I'm glad that you follow me around and watch what I do. But now it's your turn. Now it's your turn to take a step of faith. It's your turn to quit being a spectator and to get out and to be a sign yourself. He was challenging him. The whole conversation that we just read, it was a challenge. 
Christ didn't try to pull a rabbit out of the head or pull a quarter out from behind his ear. He said, no, I'm done with the signs for you, Nicodemus. You've seen enough. It's time for you to step out. And John, the Gospel of John, miracles are called signs. Signs are things that point to God, that show us that God is there, that God's alive, that God's got a heartbeat. And in John, the signs are, are, are like there's a lot fewer of them, and we, we tend to sort of marinate on them a little bit, like to sort of, sort of kind of think about them more. An, an entire sign can last an entire chapter. The signs are important in the Gospel of John, but you don't get as many of them. And so Nicodemus, who had seen some signs, God says to him, look, you've seen enough now. I've given you enough. What are you going to do about it? There were people in Jesus' day who would follow him around. And they weren't really followers. They just sort of were like waiting to be entertained. They were just following him around just to see what he would do next. Uh, we're still the same way, right? We have this insatiable need to be entertained. We love being entertained. Uh, I... I I'm a jogger, and, and uh, in the wintertime, I don't run outside because I'm a whim, it's too cold. Uh, but in the wintertime, I run in the, uh, on the treadmill. And it is boring, so boring, the treadmill is boring. And so much so that I have to watch something every time on the treadmill, because running in place, I have to be entertained, or else I'm not going to finish that job. And so I need a high-octane movie to watch when I'm running, like a die-hard movie, lots of explosions, adrenaline build, you know. Like I have to be entertained, or I'm not going to finish. It's a good metaphor for life, right? Uh, many of us are so unfulfilled in our lives, we're so bored in our lives that we are constantly looking for escapisms, we're trying to entertain ourselves constantly. Uh, another example of this might be the news. Uh, news is like 90% entertainment these days. Uh, and I would say that many of us, we're buying what they're selling. Uh, you know, many of us watch the news simply to be entertained. Maybe we even enjoy, look forward to bad news or controversial news because I don't know, it gives us something to talk about. We enjoy that sort of thing. It gives us something to do. It preoccupies our mind. And what about our, our phones, right? Our phones are like handheld entertainment. I mean, we can have entertainment anytime we want. We're waiting in line for something. Well, let's pull out our phone to do something, right? Uh, I mean, it distracts us from work. It distracts us from life. It distracts us from each other. And, and what about, uh, I mean, Think about uh, a little child of uh, a baby at home. You've heard of them, have I? <laughs> uh, but anyway, I was, I was holding him the other night, and I was holding him in my lap. And of course, he's a little baby. He likes big sounds, big noises, the TV. I was, we were watching a rerun of like the Big Bang Theory or something, and, and he kept stretching his head to look at Sheldon. And I was like, there's nothing to see there, son. You're not going to get his jokes. I don't get his jokes half the time. Uh, but I was holding him in my lap, and I said, son, this is, this is dad time. We're hanging out now. He would smile, and then he'd start straining his neck to see the TV. I'm like, how are you already a teenager? How does this happen? You're already prioritizing the screen. You're going to be slamming your bedroom door next month. And the point is, is that we are hired. We want more and more entertainment. N.T. Wright, a great New Testament scholar, he said, you know, in all of Jesus' miracles and all of his signs, we often forget the purpose of his coming here wasn't to entertain us. It was to save us from the shipwreck of the world to save us. That's why he came here. We, get, we forget that sometimes, don't we? If Christ were nothing more than an entertainer, the most common phrase of the Bible wouldn't be fear not. It would be, now for my next trick. He would have no more value to us than a street magician. I mean, that, that's the truth, though. I think that some of us sort of keep God at arm's length. We're, we're a God cheerleader. We're, we're all about saying that we're a believer, but maybe we're more like Nicodemus than we realize. Maybe we're more about the spectacle. Maybe we're more about being entertained. Maybe we haven't really acted upon our faith. Uh, the Israelites, this great thing happened. They were freed from Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. And they get across. And, and man, what a dramatic, chromatic moment. I mean, my goodness. And they get across. And then there's this moment where Moses goes to the mount. And Moses is there for days. And days become weeks. And you know what happens? They, they got really bored. I mean, they, were, they had all the plagues, and they could cross the sea, and it was almost like they were saying, hey, season one of Yahweh was really good, but season two is kind of boring. And they got really bored with God. And you know what they did? They made a golden idol. And they said, if you're going to be up in that mountain by yourself, we're going to entertain ourselves. We'll have our own golden idol. And to which God said, okay, okay, look, if you want to see me, if you want, really want to hear from me, you can hear from me. And it says that God spoke to God's people. God knew what he was doing here. God spoke to them, and, and the scripture says that his voice was like thunder. 
The earth should sound like trumpets coming from every direction. It was assault on the senses. And so much so that the people said, okay, we take it back. We don't want to hear from you anymore, God. We're done. We don't want to hear from God anymore. God is too scary. I love that. Uh, Barbara Brown Taylor, in her book, When God is Silent, she said this about God. She said, for those Christians who want, who are demanding to hear God's voice, who are demanding to see God's face, let me tell you, you are safer splitting an atom than you are doing that. The point is that we can't take that. We think we want to hear God's voice. We think we want to see God face to face. But our human bodies just cannot take that. We cannot absorb that. There is a reason why God is silent sometimes. There's a reason for that. Uh, Moses was one of the only people on earth who had like, direct, one-on-one, -on -one, regular access to God. And when he did, his whole bodily composition changed. He became fluorescent. His face began to glow. It, was, it changed him. We just can't take that. Uh, I went to the dentist this week. Everyone's favorite place. And, and as I was there, I, I had a dental hygienist. who was my regular you know, six-month queen or whatever. And, and I recognized her from last time. And, and I thought this was funny. She... It wasn't until I opened my mouth that she was examining my teeth that she said, oh yeah, I remember you. I was like, what is, the, what is it about my teeth that's so memorable? Uh, but anyway, she was cleaning my teeth and she said, you're the pastor, right? I said, yeah, Harvard. And uh, she began uh, asking me these questions about uh, faith and life. And she began talking about the coronavirus and some things in her life that were going on and just sort of light stuff, but it was spiritual. And I had some thoughts in the matter. But I couldn't answer because her hands were in my mouth. I thought maybe I could nod my head, but I was like, well, she's poking around my mouth. I was going to hurt myself. I thought maybe I could communicate with my eyes, but that would be weird. Uh, so I just sort of sat there and did nothing. At one point, I gave a thumbs up, like, yeah, you're on the right track. Yeah. Uh, but then I realized, you know, she's talking, she knows I can't talk. Uh, she has a pastor right there, and she's talking to me because she knows I will listen, and I have to listen, right? Uh, I think that God is the same way sometimes. You know, we demand a lot of God. We want God to come to us, uh, to speak to us. But sometimes in a world where we are given advice ad nauseum, advice when we don't even want it, uh, it's good to have a God who just stays silent, who just listens. A God who lets us figure things out on our own. You know, we make a lot of demands of God. We say, God, tell us this now. Tell us this now. But only idols will, will give you exactly what you want. Only idols will tell you, will answer you all the time. Alexa, Siri, they'll answer you all the time. And I think this is why we become frustrated with God, because God is wild and untamed. God is uncontrollable. God does what God wants. God is not your butler. God is not your in-home therapist. God uh, is not your pastor whose office you can go into at any time. God cannot be bought with money. Your tithe is not guaranteed that God will speak to you. Uh, your charity, your sacrifice does not buy you a meeting with God. You have no leverage over God, no, no bargaining tool. You can't twist God's arm. God is not controlled. Job knew this. Job in chapter 30, uh, he was getting very frustrated with God. He said, I stand here and you merely look at me, God. That's what Job said. I think that encapsulates really well how we pray sometimes, our frustration with God. We stand here and you merely look at me. Uh, remember, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he bends down to pray, he knows his time is coming to die. He bends down to pray, he says, Lord, take this cup away from me. Let it pass. It's another way of saying, do I have to die? Is there another way to save humanity? And what did he give him? He gave him silence. He didn't give them his mercy because he knew that he had to be a sign of mercy for the world. There are, time, there are times for signs, and then there are times to be a sign. How many of you have ever been to uh, Niagara Falls? Anyone been to Niagara Falls? Oh, great. Hopefully the Canadian side. That's the side to go on. Uh, we had a family vacation there. When I was a teenager, we went to Niagara Falls. And we did the whole thing. We went on the ship, and we wore the raincoats, you know. I went to the museum, and one of the most popular stories at the Niagara Falls Museum, I love this, uh, there's a guy, he said, for money, he said, look, uh, folks, I am going to type work walk across Niagara Falls. And this big crowd showed up, they're like, yeah, we want to see that. And so he, he true to his work, he, he actually typed work this walk across Niagara Falls, it's pretty amazing. He comes back, he says, all right, now, what do, you want to, do you want to see me do this with a wheelbarrow? And so he tied rope walks again, but now he's pushing a wheelbarrow across the falls. 
And he does it. He comes back and they're like, going nuts. How did he do this? He said, I've got one more thing to show you. Who wants me to see, who wants to see me do this pushing a human in the wheelbarrow? And the crowd went crazy. They were like, yes, I would love to see that. But here's what he did. <laughs> he said, any volunteers? <laughs> no takers, right? Nobody raised their hand. And I think that's true to our faith. You know, God says, look, you see my signs, you see my miracles, you've been entertained by things that I do, things that you've heard. Uh, but who's ready to come out of the stands and actually go out in faith with something? You know, do we have any volunteers? And what he says to Nicodemus that, I mean, I'm going to summarize the whole conversation with like this. Are you ready to volunteer? Are you ready to be born again? Are you ready to do something with faith? Uh, I was at a an interracial event here in Wilmington. It was all pastors, African-American pastors and white pastors. And it was years ago, right after the, uh, a lot of the stuff that was going on in Baltimore, a lot of race relations issues, and it's still bad now, but not nearly as bad as it was then. And we got together as a, as a way to sort of try to show the Wilmington community that we are not reconciled, that we're living and loving one another. And, and uh, we got together, and there were all these ideas passed around. Everyone went around the room and shared their feelings. And, and at the end, we tried to figure out what we could do together. And we talked about certain events, uh, maybe bringing in a guest speaker and have an interracial event and this sort of thing. And, uh, one guy, an older African-American guy, he got sort of, got sort of fed up and he said, look, I, I've been in so many of these meetings, I can't even begin to tell you. He's like, look, just go do something. <laughs> He's like, these meetings are usually all talk. What we need to do is just, just go home and make peace with someone. Make peace with someone in your church, in your neighborhood, at work. Just go make, just do something. Quit talking about things and just go do them. And that frustration that he was feeling, that's the kind of frustration that Christ was feeling. I've been waiting on you, Nicodemus. You've seen my signs. I go do something about it. What I want to say to you this morning is this. Maybe you're feeling like a Christian spectator. You kind of keep God at arm's length. You've been watching God. You've been following God. You've, been, you've heard about the miracles. Maybe you've heard from a friend about something great that God has done in your life. But I want to ask you this morning, are you more of a spectator? Um, maybe you're someone this morning who's crying out for a sign. Lord, please speak to me. I'm waiting. I need to, I need to hear from you. But I want to tell you something. There might be a good reason why God isn't giving you any more signs. Maybe you've heard all the signs. Maybe he's given you enough signs. Maybe he, he's given you a church and he's given you the scripture. Maybe he's given you faithful friends in your life who are speaking to you. Maybe he's saying, no more signs. It is time for you to go forth and be the sign. And I think that is where many of us are. In that tension between seeing the sign and being the sign. I want to ask you this morning, are there any volunteers? Let us pray. Lord, from time to time we admit that we get lost just in marvel of you. We become like bystanders. And yet we pass up opportunities every day to serve you, to do something big in faith, and to maybe even be reconciled to someone. And so Lord, I pray that you would give us the courage, that you would give us the passion and the zeal, to be like Christ was hoping Nicodemus would be in that moment. Lord, help us to not be spectators anymore, but to live our faith boldly. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen.